East Coast. Good album everywhere. I'm Judy Friedman Kadish, director of AFSI, Americans for a Safe Israel. Since its formation in 1970, AFSI has been educating about the need for a whole Israel, emphasizing the biblical, historical, and legal rights to the land of Israel. Our weekly newsletter is read by thousands. Please sign up if you haven't already to get our point of view on important news, must reads, and recommended event listings. Additionally, we frequently take to the streets to stand tall with our beloved homeland. On, twice, on our twice yearly missions to Israel, we give our participants an inside view of what's going to be happening on the ground. We look forward to our next mission this coming spring, and everyone is invited to join us. Today, we're honored to have as our guest speaker, Dr. Mordechai Nisan. The format of the meeting will be a presentation by Mordechai, during which you can write questions for him in the chat below. We will go through them and we'll ask as many as time allows, and we'll make an effort to have the essence of every question answered. While we enjoy your commentary, we will only present, be presenting questions to the speaker, not, not statements. To introduce our important guest, I'd like to introduce someone very special. Moshe Phillips, AFC's recently elected national chairman, has, is with us today. Moshe first joined AFC when he was a high school student. He became a member of the national board in 2013. And this last August, he was elected AFC's national chairman. For over 20 years, his columns have appeared in top news outlets like the Jerusalem Post, Aretz Sheva, and the Jewish Press. He is currently also a weekly columnist for JNS. Moshe is a veteran pro-Israel activist, He's a frequent commentator on Jewish affairs and a prolific author. A past board member of the AZM, or American Zionist Movement, Phillips previously served as national director of the U.S. Division of Hayrut and on the staff of CAMRA in Philadelphia. He also was a delegate to the 2020 World Zionist Congress with me. This is his first, but certainly will not be his last appearance on, at an AFC Zoom or other event. Thank you for being with us today, Moshe. Please Thank you, it. everyone. I, I just have to say that uh, some of the folks that are joining us as as participants could easily be presenters today. I, that's um, I said. We have a very distinguished. Uh, yeah, that, that, that we have Doctor that we have Doctor Alex, Alex Alex Grobman and Shmuel Ben Gad and Mayor and Jolowitz, Madoff. The, yeah, and Mayor Jolowitz, the former national uh, director of of ZOA. We have some some. Some folks here I'm very happy to see join us and very honored that you're joining us today. And that we're happy everyone's joining us, but just want to give a shout out. We'll be contacting some of you gentlemen, no doubt, uh, to be presenters at future Zooms. So without any delay, I'd like to introduce Rabbi Ari Abramowitz. Rabbi Abramowitz leads an organization called Nevut. He's going to uh, give us a little bit of an idea of what Nevut is and what he does, and then uh, lead us in a uh, mission barrack for the Israeli soldiers. I wanted to share with you, first of all, welcome everyone. And just um, a little bit during this war, I was um, serving in the IDF as a combat soldier. Uh, we were in the north of Israel. This was before the ground invasion started. And there was explosions that were going on all around us. And at one point, I heard one of the soldiers that was around me. I heard, I heard some of them, this, they're having a discussion and they're talking about, you see what's going on on the news? And... I was like trying to listen more into what they're saying. Again, I'm an American from here, from New York, serving in the IDF. Again, I'm now married with four kids. I run an organization for the well-being of the lone soldiers back here in the States when they come back called Nevut. And, you know, I go back all the time to do my reserve duty. And here it is. They're talking about what's going on in the news and I'm listening. And all of a sudden they're like, you see what's going on with all the, uh, the what's going on, the anti-Semitism on campus and everything going on. I'm like, guys, you're worried about what's going on in America? And right here, we're in the middle of getting bombed in the north of Israel. And it was something that woke me up to the reality of Ke'ish Echad Belev Echad. We are one unit. We are one, one body all together. And what happens 
whether it's going on in Israel or in the United States or anywhere around the world, we'll all feel this together. And it's something that's so powerful. And for myself, being not only a soldier, but being someone that works every single day with thousands of lone soldiers, their spouses and the parents, making sure that they have the support that they need so that when they finish their service, that they're able to lead successful lives. And this is what I do. But being able to be part of the IDF as well, it is honestly the most incredible thing to see the support that we have from Jews all around the world. And it goes the same way, that the, soul, that the Jewish people in Israel feel that also with what's going on. And just to give a little bit of a story, just so everyone understands what's, what's happening. So I finished, just so everyone knows in short, I just finished my service. I was a combat soldier 2009, 2010 in the IDF. And I went and I got my smichat rabbanut, I became a rabbi. And I went back to um, my wife and I, we got married, went back to Israel. And we were running an organization for lone soldiers in Israel. And in 2017, we moved back to the States. And with, at that point, there was so, lone soldiers that are soldiers without family in Israel that came back. They finished their service and came back to the States. And here it is all of a sudden, they're really struggling after and we had a soldier that called me up. He was in California and he was like, um, I don't think I'm going to make it out today. I'm going to, uh, and we got professionals on the phone and we we're able to go help this soldier be able to get the support that they were needed. Again, literally a few minutes before that happened, uh, before this meeting today, I've been dealing with also another suicidal case, unfortunately, that we're dealing with. These are things that we deal with every day and we deal with the well being and the community of the soldiers. But it's something really special to be able to have such an amazing support from the Jewish community and from the community around the world that gives us support for the Chayalim, give us support for the soldiers. And, you know, my, my commitment as not only being a soldier myself, but as being someone that works with the soldiers. And unfortunately, um, a week ago, last week, um, I got, we got called up this past month to be able to go back into the reserves again for the Lebanon and unfortunately, what happened was, um, so I, I told my commander, I can't come in right now because we have many programs that are going on here in the United States and half our staff, our reservists as well, they went back to Israel. So, you know, holding down the ship, I said, I'll come after the Chagim back to Israel, after the holidays, I'll go back to Israel. And we were in the middle of having a program on the last days of Simchat Torah uh, was last week, and uh, unfortunately, I got the news that four of my comrades were killed and six more were injured. It was uh, really, uh, it was really horrible to hear that. So definitely something that you know affects me very much. But um, at the same time, this is exactly how I'm feeling. Being able to recognize how my team is going through everything, how how much the mental health and well being of the soldiers is so vital. And so this is just a. Uh, a little about what we do is we have the community of support therapists, um, group therapy. We help them with their careers after so they can get back on track. So that's just a little bit about my story in uh, two minutes. Rabbi, could you please just give the website address for your organization? Sure. It's, um, I can put it on the chat also just for everyone who wants. It's just nevut.org. Uh, that's the organization. It's uh, on the chat. But again, nevut means to navigate in Hebrew. And so our job is, and this is what it is, is just like we have to navigate in the army. Our next step, we have to make sure to help them navigate the next step of their life. And that's my commitment is like when this happened, I said to all the soldiers, we're just going to do more good and we'll help out more of the soldiers because that's what we're here for. And this is what Ami Israel is about. Thank you so much, Rabbi Yeshur Koach. Could, could you please read the Mishabarach? Yes. So I'm going to read the Mishabarach for the Chayalim. Mishabarach Chavoteinu Avraham Yitzchak V'Yaakov. Hu yivarech et chayalei tzva ha'gana l'Yisrael, ha'omdim al mishmar artsenu v'arei Eloheinu, migvol ha'levanon v'yad mitbar mitzrayim, u'min ha'yam ha'gadol ad lavo ve'arava, v'yabasha, v'avir u'vayam, yitein Adunai Yisraelveinu ha'kamim aleinu, nigafim lefnehem, ha'kadosh baruch hu yishmor v'yatsil es chayalinu, mikol tzara v'tzuka u'mikol nega machala, ויישלח ברכה והצלחה בכל מעשה ידיהם, ידבר שונאינו תחתיהם, ויעטרם בכתר ישועה, ובעטרת ניצחון, ויוקם בהם הכתוב, כי אדוני אלוהיכם ההולך עמכם, להילחם לכם עם אויביכם, להושיע אתכם, ונאמר אמן. אמן. רבי, תודה רבה לכם על כך שאתם עושים, ועל כל העבודה שאתם עושים. ועוד פעם, אני מבקש לכם לבוא ולבוא 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 
as as you evaluate, you know, where you want to give your end of year gifts uh, and donations, and and understand that that it's an important organization. Not that AFSI is not an important organization, of course, but you know, we we exist as all part like like the rabbi said as as one unit. So I, I'd like to to introduce Dr. Mordechai Nissan. Um, he is a retired lecturer in Middle East Studies at Hebrew University, the author of many books. Uh, one about Lebanon that I'm sure is appropriate for today's conversation, as well as his most recent book, The Crack Up of the Israeli Left. So I think we get an idea from that title what what the doctor is all about, and we'll uh, we'll get started with a uh, with a quick question for for the doctor, Doctor Nissan. You're with us. Yes, Moshe. Okay, great, great. Thank you so much. So uh, could we please start off with uh, asking you what you think Americans and Canadians should know about the last year in Israel that we may not know? About Israel generally? Well, about the situation, the moment itself. The situation. We, uh, we are living through a very tragic but glorious situation. Tragic because of the loss of Jewish life. Israeli lives, civilians and soldiers. It's very painful for everybody. There's like a shadow over the country and over people's individual lives. At the same time, we are doing extraordinary things. We meaning primarily the army, of course, which we love and respect and honor. And they are doing an extraordinary job on seven fronts our little country on the edge of the Mediterranean, on the edge of the desert, is standing up to seven enemies, seven military fronts simultaneously, with only certain aid, obviously from the United States. But the fighting itself is done by us alone, and that we are doing this, and we're able to do this, and we're persisting in doing this. Even though there are voices who call on Israel to stop and seek a ceasefire, which is often a euphemism for capitulation. But the fact that we're able to do this day in and day out, 24-7, literally 24-7, as it were, there's no Shabbat for the army, as you know. And we're holding our own. And we are, if not crushing the enemies, we are hitting them killing them, overwhelming them in terms of persons and material. And therefore, it's a glorious moment in Jewish history. And so as much as it's a tragic moment, it is a glorious moment, which for hundreds of years, we'll talk about it as a pivotal point when things came to a head in October 2023. Tavshin Pei David, and Kamu Aleinu Lechalotenu, as we say, Velo Yechlu Lanu, but they can't overwhelm us. This is my opening remark, Moshe, to your question, and it's an answer which is both uh, factual and emotional, and maybe spiritual as well, and I hope we'll all keep it in mind when we read about some of the less pleasant things that are transpiring. The subject that I am talking about is anti-Semitism, and I want to thank Moshe Phillips, who turned to me with this invitation, and recalling that we had met somewhere way back in the past. And my uh, connection with AFSI also goes way back in the past, so I'm very pleased to be part of this evening. Evening in Israel, noon time with you. Herzl said, Herzl, the political proponent of modern Zionism, that when a Jewish state will be created, that will be the end of anti-Semitism. Very simple calculation. Anti-Semitism is based on opposition to Jews, hatred of Jews, wherever they were in the world or wherever they are in the world in one form or another. So Herzl understood. But if the Jews leave the countries of their dispersion, Herzl thought, and they assemble and congregate in the land of Israel as a single people there, then there's no reason for the Gentile world 
<clears throat> in any way to a malign us or hate us or harm us because they didn't want us wherever it was in Russia, Ukraine, France. And we left, as he wrote, Herzl, we'll leave with a parade and the Gentiles will play music and be happy that we're leaving because they'll be getting rid of us, which they want. And when we come here, when all the Jewish people is here in Eretz Yisrael, there's no reason for anti-Semitism. That was, as it turned out, a very naive idea. It wasn't an unreasonable thought, but it was naive. Because in thinking about we'll have an idyllic life with harmony and coexistence with other peoples in the Middle East, it turned out that those peoples in the Middle East, as we all know, don't want us. So they didn't want us there outside of Israel, and they don't want us here inside of Israel. As Ruth Weiss once said, there's no place for the Jews. So we're now living through the single fate of Israel conducting this war of survival. And the Jews in the world, in the West, in the States, and elsewhere, contending <clears throat> with a surge of anti-Semitism, which hasn't been known in this <clears throat> magnitude and militancy, maybe ever, in certain countries, in particular in the United States. <clears throat> so now we are confronting reality, facing anti-Semitism in the homeland and in the diaspora. And what is anti-Semitism about? It's something which goes back to the beginning of our national history in biblical times. And we sometimes ignore or forget that or belittle that. How can the Bible say something which will be valid three, four thousand years thereafter? But it's valid. Esav sonet Yaakov. This is what we say. Esav, a term for the Gentiles, for the Goyim. Het Yaakov, a symbol of the people of Israel. And when that is a belief in the Jewish people in ancient history and in medieval history, toward modern history, that we are <clears throat> destined to suffer hatred, opposition, malignment from the Gentile world, it's a given fact. It's an objective fact. It's not something ethereal. It's not something that's temporary. Rather, it's a fixed, permanent fact. And because I have an inclination to try and tell what I believe to be the truth, I think we have to face the truth. <clears throat> this is a, a mature understanding of our place in the world, in reality, facing reality. <clears throat> and so if this is our fate or destiny to face Gentile hatred, opposition, discrimination, and worse than that, then we have to confront that realistically and not imagine that we're going to live an idyllic existence as Jews in Israel, in the Middle East, or as Jews are perhaps in the United States. <clears throat> Rather, the reality is far more convoluted and often can be very unpleasant, but it's something we have to contend with and deal with in the best way possible. So I, for one, am not really perturbed as such by anti-Semitism if it doesn't take a violent turn. If it doesn't take a violent turn. Just don't harm my people. You know, I come from Montreal, where there's a question of the French and the English. When I lived there, I left there in 1972. And I'll just say this very briefly, obviously. There was a question of separatism, Quebec separatism from Canada. And there was tension between Anglos and French and so on. And I was very sympathetic to the French, which I still am. But that stopped at the border when, if they harm my people. So we can have uh, feelings of sympathy and empathy and support for other peoples, other communities, for their problems, for their struggles, for their aspirations. But if they cross the line and there's an inch across the line against us, against the Jewish people, then my sympathy and support end. And I think that's a healthy formula for how to deal with the Gentile world. <clears throat> we are very generous people. We're very giving people. Israel is the Jewish people, the Jews in the diaspora, very giving people. We don't only help build a Jewish hospital, we'll donate to build a, a general hospital. We're very generous. But we don't want to be generous to people who abuse and harm and threaten us. So I think this is a simple formula which people can 
<clears throat> considered. The state of anti-Semitism in the United States today is not just a local, let's say, goyim Jewish question, Gentile Jewish question. It's part of a wider social framework. And here I want to mention four names which kind of uh, focus our attention on what we're seeing uh, regarding anti-Semitism today. The first name I mention is Karl Marx. Karl Marx was born from a Jewish background, but he was converted to Christianity at the age of six. Karl Marx. He died in 1882. Everybody knows the name Karl Marx and heard about Marxism and the like. Karl Marx, it would be said, was an atheist who hated God, which is ironic, meaning he didn't believe in God, but he more than just didn't believe in God, he hated God. It's like saying, you know, I don't like the Jews, the Jews really aren't the people, but I hate them. He proposed a series of ideas, Karl Marx did, to undermine the family, religion, nations, countries, in the name of an international Marxist revolution. So I mentioned him as at first because he was a furious anti-Semite. He totally alienated himself from the Jewish people, and uh, he wrote a, a paper in 1844, The Jewish Question, in which he said the Jews only love money, that's their God. Money is the Jewish God, <clears throat> that kind of stereotype. And he went on to deny the existence of the Jewish people and that they have no right to exist. This is Karl Marx. So the degree to which Karl Marx is alive and kicking today, and you hear about it in the States, Marxism and so on, Marx's currents of thought and the like, this is Karl Marx. And he is alive and kicking today. And he's referred to today and he's read today and he inspires people today those who want to eliminate or demote religion, who propose undermining the nuclear family, undermining given existence of countries and borders and sovereignty and independence. This is Karl Marx. And he radiates today everywhere, and no less in the United States. The second name I want to mention is... is Edward Said, Edward Said. Edward Said was a Christian Arab who uh, was born in Cairo, though he said he was born in Jerusalem. He's no longer alive. He was a professor of English literature at Columbia University and made a big name for himself in proposing, in what became a classic text, Orientalism, proposing that there are no fixed values or truths. The example he gave throughout this book, which is a very interesting book, Orientalism, is that a non-Oriental, let's say an American, an Englishman, a Frenchman, cannot honestly, fairly, objectively judge peoples from another country, and therefore they have no right to talk or evaluate or judge that country and its people and culture. And therefore, everything that was written by Westerners about Arabs, Muslims, Islam, and the like, <clears throat> is of no value and legitimacy. So there's no truth. That's the bottom line here. There's no truth. They're like floating categories in the universe, values in the universe, but nothing is true. And you can't prove anything that's true. It's only your subjective opinion. Edward Said became an icon on university campuses from the 70s and thereafter, 70s, 80s and the like. Everybody read, who was a student in those days and until today, read <clears throat> Edward Said. And it made them think of the United States in particular, but not only, as a country which caused evil to other peoples. It's easier to say that about the English and French who were colonial powers in Africa and Asia, but America always you know, stands out for people as the, uh, as the Iranians would say, is the big Satan. For Edward Said, America was an evil empire. It interfered in the countries around the world. It demeaned them, it insulted them, it governed them, it exploited them and the like. 
And so America is an evil country, which is a theme that resonates in America, as you know, in certain circles. This is Edward Said. And of course, he was no friend of the Jews. One of his books was called The Question of Palestine. And the very title tells you that Israel has no right to exist. It's only Palestine. This is Edward Said. He had a great impact, a negative impact, but a very strong impact on university students and the, and the culture and academia in the West. The third name I want to mention here, apropos of anti-Semitism, is uh, the former president, Barack Obama. Barack Obama, whose very seedy biography, autobiography, biography, <clears throat> a man who lived in a world of deceit and deception, was no friend of the Jews from his background prior to his presidency, demonstrated, as we know, I don't have to go into this with you, you people know this better than me, you know, his pastor and his, uh, those he was associated with, among them, Edward C., who I just mentioned, Barack Obama was a friend of the Muslims. Became president, his first address abroad was in Cairo. He told President Mubarak at the time, invite Muslim Brotherhood people to my talk in Cairo. Muslim Brotherhood is an Islamic organization founded in 1928 in Egypt. It still exists. <clears throat> and among its major goals, ostensibly, is the destruction of the West the destruction of America, in the name of Islam. Islam, they have a theme, it's called Islam is the solution. You don't need democracy, liberalism, uh, capitalism, anything. You just have to look inside Islam for the answer to all personal, individual, and national collective questions. <clears throat> so in this sense, Obama took up this ideology. He demonstrated his <clears throat> support for the Muslim world. As we well know, he accommodated Iran's nuclear program. He accommodated Iran's nuclear program. <clears throat> he was very critical of Israel at many points in time, even though he provided military assistance, it should be noted. But he was not a friend of Israel. He was a very pugnacious, militant opponent of Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's prime minister, our prime minister. And in this way, he's another mark on the line of anti-Semitism. And the fourth person to mention, apropos October 7th, is Yechye Sinwar, the now dead leader of Hamas. And Yechye Sinwar was responsible for promoting, not only him, of course, other leaders of Hamas, and other Islamic organizations, parties, and fronts. Yechia Sinwar was, uh, was the leader in promoting for about 12 years, more than 12 years, 14 years, promoting the war against Israel. Ideologically, propaganda-wise, militarily, as we well know, politically, and the like. <clears throat> and he's the one who took all of the matches that I mentioned now and lit them all and set Israel on fire on October 7th, 2023. Hamas is an anti-Semitic organization. Its charter or covenant is very explicit on that. That's consistent with the Muslim Brotherhood, of which Hamas is a, is a, uh, a partner. <clears throat> and in this sense, Yichye Sinwar headed the anti-Semitism in the Muslim world until now. It's important for me to mention here that if we talk about Muslims against Jews, um, we should understand it's Muslims against Jews, not because of Israel alone. Islam, in its founding in the seventh century, <clears throat> developed a tremendous animus, hostility, hatred toward Jews in its founding. Some people say that uh, this is not the case, but it's absolutely the case if one reads the sources. <clears throat> and it expressed itself in Muhammad, the, the prophet that they believe in as the founder of Islam in the seventh century, that he wanted the Jews to accept him as an authentic, legitimate prophet and to accept the religion or the belief that he was promoting, which becomes known as Islam, of course. 
And the Jews rejected him and didn't believe in him and considered him to be an imposter, a fraud. And from there on, Islam developed in its literature and in its propaganda a deep hatred of Jews and the fact that Jews lived in Muslim countries for 1,400 years in Yemen, Iraq, Iran, Morocco, Algeria, etc. And Jews were subject to Muslim rule, subjugated under Muslim rule, was a very terrible situation for Jews to endure. And all this prior to Israel's establishment, therefore there are two levels of Muslim antagonism to Jews. One is the historic built-in antagonism to Jews and Judaism. And secondly, the modern layer of hatred of Israel as they consider her to be an interloper state in the land of Palestine. So when we put all this together, I want to move towards concluding. When we put all this together, anti-Semitism sometimes is considered to be a product of the West, um, something that came out of Christianity's war against the Jews, Christianity presented as the supersessionary religion after Judaism. And Islam, for its part, also considered itself to be the supersessionary, meaning coming in place of, replacing the replacement religion, we say, in place of Judaism. So both Christian Western world and the Eastern Muslim world both developed antagonism, we could say anti-Semitism. Today it's more common for some people to say hatred of Jews rather than anti-Semitism, which is a bit nebulous. But from Christianity and from Islam, from the West and the East, we have faced this uh, horrent and torrent of hatred for hundreds of years. And it all came to a head now. And this really is the question which somehow... Uh, leaves us uh, without a solution, without an answer. And that is, how does it happen when the Palestinians on October 7th massacre, torture Jews, Jewish civilians, helpless, men, women, and children, and murder 1,200 people in a day? And then there's a burst of enthusiasm in parts of the West among certain groups who celebrate Hamas's massacre of Jews rather than <clears throat> denouncing it. How did that elicit such a positive response? So our simple answer is, well, they're anti-Semitic from before. These people are out there demonstrating, uh, marching, attacking Jews. They hated the Jews before October 7th, and so this kind of just incentivize them, you know. <clears throat> it was a moment of exhilaration for them to put all their hatred into a, into a specific purpose against Israel. And so the war against Israel is not only in the Middle East, the war against Israel is also in the campus of Columbia University and UCLA and McGill and Toronto and et cetera in the West. How did that happen? Well, it happened because there is latent anti-Semitic feelings among certain people and they therefore exploited those feelings to take to the streets and the campuses to demonstrate against Jews and Israel. But even that's not really a sufficient answer. It's not an incorrect answer. It's of course correct, but it's not sufficient. It's like something else operative here and we are somewhat at a loss to put our finger on what is it exactly. Well, it has to do with changes in American culture and society. It has to do with uh, BDS. It has to do with BLM. It has to do with that uh, term uh, intersectionality, with mobilizing and engineering people's consciousness to think of Jews in a negative light, because that's part of a more general campaign that's conducted against other peoples and for other ideas against America or against the West or against the middle class or against capitalism and against the religion, etc. And so Israel is thrown into the pot with all of those other criminal elements, quote unquote. And so you just press the button and there you go. On October 7th or October 8th, 
<clears throat> and this hatred just bursts out. So it's part of a, a context. That's a bad word in America today, but it fits here what I'm saying. It's part of that context <clears throat> of these various ideological movements which appear in the United States, political movements, and have left their mark. And uh, in that respect, it's not that we Jews did anything bad. American Jews didn't do anything wrong, bad, harmful. And before Israel even responded, the way it militarily responded, they were already the enemies of the Jews in Israel out there demonstrating against us. So there's something operative here which maybe has to be uh, looked at from the perspective not of a rational explanation, but that anti-Semitism slash hatred of Jews comes from another world. Something which is high above us or way below us. Um, it's like black magic. It's like they invoke the goyim, those goyim. And I should say with great emphasis, they're wonderful goyim. They're wonderful Gentiles. Wonderful. I'm pleased and honored to have wonderful Gentile friends in America and elsewhere. So, of course, I'm talking in generalizations. But to come back, the, uh, the, the, the Gentiles have been infected, programmed with, with hatred of Jews from time immemorial. And they can't get it out of their system. It's like a baby is born to suck milk from his mother, but then the baby is also born with an innate uh, disgust towards Jews. Uh, something that's there. Where? I don't know where. In his soul, in his spirit. Their spirit it doesn't have to be taught, doesn't have to be uh, studied, read about. It's like there's something operative maybe in the universe as God created it. Isaf Soneli Yaakov, what I said earlier from Rashi, that they go and hate the Jews. There's a Gemara in the Talmud, it says, they go and go up to their bed at night and come down in the morning, and all the time they're thinking, how can they harm the Jews? You know? And if that's the case, we have to feel sorry for some of these people who have been infected with this anti-Semitic virus. It's like a psychic illness, a psychic illness, a psychic malady. And I almost feel sorry for them. Maybe I do, for those who don't harm us. But if they just have it in their system and they can't look at a Jew without seeing something which is not there, but for them, they're seeing something, Jews are corrupt, or Jews are liars, or Jews are untrustworthy, and so on. It's kind of collective uh, denunciation. So if they can't get rid of that, so if they don't harm us physically, I say personally, Shia, okay. They can't help it. What do you want from them? They've been inoculated with this germ. Where, when, how, I don't exactly know. But it seems that it exists in places of the world which uh, even maybe don't know what Jews are about. But then you go to places in the world or study other places in the world where there are hardly any Jews, and indeed there, there's no hatred of Jews. But if you, maybe if you look deeply, you'll find it. For example, India, India, there are very few Jews in India. There have always been Jews in India, but not in great numbers. But uh, there have been times in Indian modern history, India's modern history, where there was a great uh, yearning for a, a leader based on the model of Hitler. So even India, but I also have Indian friend, friends. So I, I, I'm Doctor. Indian with friends. Here we are confronting reality as best we can, trying to understand reality as best we can, and hoping that the going will be healthy in their souls and that we will be safe in our lives. Thank doctor, you. We, we, doctor. Thank you, Doctor. We, we do have some questions coming in. I think Judy has a question. I, I, I have my own question, and, and then we have questions from the... I, I from, just from I want to ask something very quickly. I, I looked up some of your previous work and um, in the Jerusalem, um, Jerusalem Summit, 2016, quoted uh, the historian and theory, theorist Clausewitz who considered war to be the conduct of politics by other means. For the Arabs, diplomacy is clearly the conduct of war by political means, but the Israelis have largely abandoned the arena, unable or unwilling to speak openly and in detail about Arab aggression, mendacity, and terrorism. 
They have failed mm -hmm. to conceptual, conceptualize a grand rhetorical political strategy. Bottom line, a subliminal, subliminal urge to lose seems at times a driving force in Israeli diplomacy. Do you think this is this kind of mentality that you were expressing is something that would have um, uh, encouraged anti-Semitism? Well, you read a long quote there. What did I actually say? I said a few well, things. Said the latter. Jews were ready to lose. Yes. And uh, and and that's not a very that's not a very attractive thing, I suppose, to to people. Um, and I don't. Do you think that's changed? Did October seventh change that? For some Israelis, yes. For some Israelis, it changed. You know, it's not uncommon for Israeli leaders to say no less Netanyahu, no less Netanyahu. What I'm now going to say, in quoting him, and you probably know this line. The IDF is the most moral army in the world. Yes. End of quote. And when some people in Israel hear that, they say, no, we're not proud of that. It doesn't do us any good. It doesn't mean that we intend to be the most immoral army in the world. But that is our you know, motto, we're the most moral army in the world is not going to get us very far. And even if we are the most moral army in the world, they still want to charge us, charge us with war crimes in the Hague. So what is this about? And somebody said in response to that, and it maybe it'll sound harsh in English, in Hebrew it doesn't bother me at all. That the army should be the, the deadliest army in the world. So what you say that we're you know, there's a famous book by, uh, at the time, Efraim Kishon, Efraim Kishon, the Israeli satirist, author, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. He was a great man, Efraim Kishon. He wrote a book after the Six-Day War in 1967, which became quite well known, and it was called, Sorry We Won. <laughs> you have to laugh at that, you know. Sorry We Won. I mean, we're, we're supposed to lose. That's the Jewish fate in history, that the goyim smash us and beat us and kill us and pogromize us, etc. And our role in history is not to win and defeat the goyim and hit the goyim. Our role is to be the victim, the loser. We're supposed to bleed, not the goyim. So we were sorry we won and we're not playing our role. And they're unhappy with that in the world because you're supposed to lose. What's happening here? And so too now. We are winning. We yes. are literally winning. So, so in Dr. Gaza, Dick we're winning. In Lebanon, we're winning. Against the uh, Houthi in Yemen, we're winning. Against Iran, so far, we're winning. Even though, as I said uh, when we met this earlier, we're supposed to now expect in Israel almost any minute an attack from Iran. The news is filled with this now, as I'm speaking with you. It's very yeah. disturbing, it's very frightening. No one can know for sure what the result will be. But so far, we've United dealt well States against said, Iran. That they, United States has said that they cannot control Israel, that if if, uh, if Iran hits again, um, Israel is on its own. I know Moshe has a question. Yeah, so so Dr. Nissan, there, there's a couple of different things. One is, I, I put on the chat for everyone the column you currently have in a, on a root Sheba. And, and I'd like to try to steer us back to some questions about Lebanon. Um, I think that's probably what's on a lot of people's minds in addition to Iran, if that's okay. So so the first question is, and this came from one of our one of the folks that is uh, an APSI supporter that emailed it to me. Um, again and again, over the years, the United Nations peacekeeping forces in southern Lebanon have proved to be completely ineffective at keeping terrorists out of that area. Why should any Israelis today agree to once again trust the UN forces to ever guard southern Lebanon? Uh, let me just mention, prior to relating to Lebanon as such, that there's an ongoing campaign in Israel in certain circles uh, through certain media outlets and in the name of certain politicians, public figures, that Israel should seek a ceasefire in Lebanon. We'll ignore Gaza now, right? That Israel should seek a ceasefire in Lebanon. 
Why? Because we've achieved certain objectives in the war in Lebanon. <clears throat> we have eliminated physically, meaning killed, the senior leadership of Hezbollah. We have killed hundreds of their fighters. We have destroyed in part or in whole villages in southern Lebanon, which are located just across our northern border, across the border of the Galilee. In respect of which, therefore, we've achieved certain major objectives. And even though at the moment they are still firing projectiles, you know, rockets, rockets and UAVs at us, still we have the upper hand, which we do. And we can continue hitting them, and they'll continue to hit us, and therefore we should stop the war. There's a campaign to stop the war. And that is a subset of a broader campaign, which says, you may know this, of course, that Netanyahu is not willing to stop the war because it serves his political interests not to stop the war. And if he would try, if he would agree to stop the war through whatever kind of arrangements, then that would uh, probably bring about the collapse of his government because... Ben Gvir and Smotrich would take their parties out of the government and the government would collapse. Having said that, having said that, the major opinion in the country is definitely to pursue the war against Hezbollah. Yeah, I, I just mean, why stop to, when you're winning? Why stop when you're winning? And if you stop when you're winning, it's, it's as if you've capitulated to the enemy. Yes. If you have a, 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 let's call it a rational perspective, and I would add, from my point of view, a Middle Eastern perspective, Israel always has to have an image. It always has to project an image that it's strong and winning. And if we say we agree to cease fire when we are basically winning, it's as if we're running away from the battlefield. And the loser will declare his victory, and he will. Hezbollah. Yeah. Um, so Carol Flato has asked, why would over 100,000 Israelis gather to demand that the hostages be released, even in exchange for prisoners who are convicted murderers? What is their mindset, knowing that Sinwar himself was a part of a thousand prisoner swap for one Gilad Shalit? Please explain how they can be so blind. I think we should admit that the government, and Netanyahu, the prime minister, has always faced, since the war began, more or less, a Terrible dilemma. It's a dilemma. All Israelis want the hostages released. And most Israelis are willing to pay, quote unquote, to get them released, which would mean stopping the war temporarily or permanently in, in Gaza, releasing hundreds of terrorists from our prisons. And they would be willing to pay that price in order to get the rest of the hostages, 101, released. And it is a terrible, terrible wrenching dilemma. How much are you willing to concede in order to get them back? And I may add, dead or alive. And the breakdown in the country politically is, broadly speaking, the left would be willing. Those are the, the questioner mentioned 100,000 people in the streets. The left, it's basically the people in the streets on behalf of a deal to get the hostages released is overwhelmingly a leftist constituency. And the people who oppose that are on the right and say they're not demonstrating in the streets for a deal. And uh, so Debbie Bauer would like to know, what, okay. what do you think is the best hostage strategy? Personally, in facing this dilemma, as... Uh, as uh, difficult as it is, you just have to take 10 minutes out of your everyday 24 hours. And for those 10 minutes, think about a hostage in a dark tunnel in Gaza for how many, what is it, 380 days? More. It's hellish just to think about it. And they're enduring it. And if we can do something to get them released, it's as if we should do that something. But then, and personally, my perspective is rooted in strategy, politics, the Middle East. I don't want to lose to the Arabs. I want to beat the Arabs to send that message to the Arabs that the way we can live in the Middle East, Israel, 
as a sovereign, strong Jewish state is to stand up, and contend successfully, if not defeat the Arabs. We cannot accept a loss. We cannot look weak. Agreed. We have to look strong. And the community which, is looks, which looks strong in Israel today is the national community. There's the people on the right, the religious Zionist community. This is the community of which I'm a part. We feel we have to show our strength and we have to continue to contend and smash the enemy in Lebanon and in Gaza and elsewhere. Okay, I have another question that, that came from my friend Zahava. She, she asked, when Ahad Barak was prime minister, he had carried out a unilateral withdrawal from southern Lebanon. That made it possible for Hezbollah rather to move in. Has, do you know if he has expressed any regrets about that horrible decision at this point? You're talking about something with which I'm uh, familiar, but very close to the subject. In terms of the Lebanese, what was the SLA, Southern Lebanese Army at the time, till 2000? <clears throat> the uh, intimate cooperation between those Lebanese in the South and other Lebanese in Lebanon with Israel and Israelis. And not one person that I have heard expressed regret for that hasty, foolhardy withdrawal from Southern Lebanon in late May 2000. Because when Israel withdrew, and it was easily foreseen what would happen, though Ehud Barak denied it at the time, he said the United Nations will be there, UNIFIL, United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon will be there, or Europeans will be there, or somebody will be there, the Lebanese army, and it'll be stable and quiet and secure. But when we left Southern Lebanon, when Ehud Barak decided on that, he handed southern Lebanon on the border of Malkia and Ve'aviv and all Azarit and Arab al Ramsha and all of the communities on the border there. He handed that to Iran. Hezbollah's Iran. Hezbollah appeared in 1982, created by Iran as their Shiite proxy in Lebanon to turn Lebanon into a radical Shiite jihadist state against Israel. And so to give something to, to Hezbollah is to give Iran a victory. So there is Iran on our border, effectively. And no, he didn't express regret. And uh, there's a lot that can be said about Ehud Barak, but regret and uh, taking responsibility or feeling guilty is not one of his characteristics. But there are many others like him. So, 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 Doctor, the original plan for us was to go till one o'clock, um, and I know that Judy had expressed this uh, idea that we'd like people to be able to stay on who wish to stay on and have a conversation. Uh, maybe Judy can state better what her idea was. But before we do that, maybe you could give us, you know, some closing, simple closing ideas to to move forward with. Um, can I just add? Oh, sure. Uh, there, there are so many people now who we hear from Israel are calling the young people the victor, the the generation of victory. Um, yes. Do you think that this is the generation of victory? And 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 do you feel strongly that um, you believe strongly that that this can be a, a true victory and and lead to a, a true. Um, cessation of hostilities by Iran? And what do you think is it will take? Do you think I, uh, Israel will have to go in and uh, do major damage in Iran? I mean, as they're now threatening to, to retaliate for the last round. In the history of the Middle East, and maybe not only in the Middle East, Muslims, Arabs do not disarm willingly. I mean, you have to fight if not destroy them, in order that they be disarmed. This is the whole discussion about UN resolutions uh, uh, 1559 and resolution 1701 and so on. They don't give up. They can endure. You know, there's a folklorish saying in the Middle East, 
a Bedouin saying that if you retaliate against your enemy after 40 years, you were hasty. Meaning, the Arabs are very strong in maintaining and sustaining difficulties, challenges, and tragedies for a very long time. And we, the Jews, the Israelis, are being tested now. If they have that same kind of stamina and commitment, not to raise their hands and surrender and call it a ceasefire or a deal of whatever kind. We have been tested if we really belong in the Middle East. And if we really belong in the Middle East, then we can pursue these wars, which are difficult and costly in human and other ways. But if we prove that we can sustain this for a year, another year, another year, and I think we can, if we have the right leadership to promote this kind of policy and instill confidence in the people, and Netanyahu is really doing an extraordinary job. On this front, we can't imagine any other leader who would be prime minister today, who would be able to juggle with all of the demands and pressures that he's under and keep his eye focused you know, on the ball, keep your eye on the ball, Bibi, and continue the war despite pressure, denunciation from abroad, pressure, denunciation from within. And he deserves an enormous credit now for what he's doing, enormous credit. Um, I think the, there's a moment in history when we see the rise of a certain community. You need a core community. It's like in early American history, they said the wasps with no denigration, when Anglo-Saxon Protestants, they were the core of America. Without them, there wouldn't have been an America, which is probably true. But over time, other groups rise and assume a leadership position, or there are multiple leaderships. In Israel, we all know the leadership was in the hands of the kibbutzim, free state, and also when the state was born, and now the mantle is on the shoulders of the religious Zionist community. Not because they're the only ones in the army, obviously not. Not because they're the only patriots in, in the country, obviously not. But they as a community symbolize, they organize a core ideological religious national commitment as a community which doesn't exist in any other group in the country, as a group, I'm saying, not as individuals. Baruch Hashem, we have all kinds of wonderful people and soldiers, and it's amazing that we're learning to meet them on the screens of the television these days. Soldiers being interviewed, I mean. But the religious Zionist community is exceptional, not only because of their military service and courage, again, it's not limited to them, but I'm talking about them, to their military service and courage, but because of the spirit they bring to the war. Many in the Israeli Zionist, in the religious Zionist community are uh, people who live in Judea and Samaria. Um, you know, I know that some Karat men and uh, ma many of them are, are activists who live in Judea and Samaria. And we have traveled there extensively and we know the, the commitment and the, the drive of the people of Judea and Samaria to hold on to yeah. the biblical Israel, um, which is so important. So uh, Judy, I think that's a great transition just to, to real quick, since we're almost at time and we'd love that people, you know, again, stay with us if, if people want to speak with each other and we'll turn off the, the, the recording. But but just to, to emphasize, really, there is no other group like AFSI that talks about Judea and Samaria, Yehuda Vishamaron, and the Golan and the need to keep these areas. There is no other group in America doing that as consistently, as long, and as passionately as we have. Um, you, know, you might think there's other groups out there, but they focus on so many other things. But this is where the core of who we are and has been from the mm -hmm. beginning. Um, so, you know, if you haven't joined AFSI as a member, please do. We need your membership. We need your support. We need your activism. We have folks here from Philadelphia and from Texas that are chapter leaders on this call, you know, we, as well as Florida, Carol. Um, so there's there's lots of needs to 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 fill positions we have for for 
chapter leadership and, and, and assist us with just being a dues paying member is huge. You know, if you can join and, and help us uh, increase our effectiveness by by joining and helping other folks to find their way to us and join, you know, I'd like to leave with those final words from me, but Judy, please take it away. Thank you. Um, no, I think those are very, very appropriate final words. Um, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, when we do the Jabotinsky Memorial every year, we uh, were, were partnering all the time with the kind of the last remaining remnants of Betar. And uh, wonderfully, following October 7th, um, Betar is, is reconstituting itself, um, active mm -hmm. in New York and uh, mm -hmm. forming in other parts of the, of the country in North America. I know it's always been active in Israel. And we, um, uh, was it yesterday? Uh, no, it was the day before. Um, we went to the new school to uh, protest the fact that the new school was allowing Francesca Albanese to speak. She's a rabid anti-Semite. Um, and they have an open invitation from Alan Dershowitz, who is not quite as far um, committed to uh, Yehuda Shamron as we are, but uh, is yet a voice of, of the right. Uh, and they refuse to let somebody like, like Mr. Dershowitz speak. So, um, you know, we, we really need to, to um, write and to be active and if at all possible to come out when there are uh, actions that are going on to express our solidarity with Israel and our, and our commitment. Uh, because I know that people who are on this talk are active and committed. And please speak to your friends and your and your family. Um, get everybody out to vote, and um, and and you know be with us not only on Zooms. Um, hopefully, we'll have a, a an in person event not in, in the not too distant future, and but that will be in New York. But please come out with us on the streets of New York, Long Island, um, and and you know be with us, be with us. So I I really thank you all for being here. I think we can unmute everybody if people just want to say hello a little.